Well, today we're going to be talking again about Kant, and I want to remind you where we were when we left off. We had drawn a little map of ethical thinking according to Kant, and I'm not going to reconstruct the whole thing now. I just want to remind you that there was an objective portion which had to do with the law and giving reasons. Roughly, if you think of this in a platonic form, it had to do with the nature of reason and reason giving you certain commands um, and then issuing in an action. Uh, and then there was a subject of something which had to do with springs of action that Plato would say stem from emotion or desire, things where you have something that is purely subjective, you value this, so you choose a certain means to it. You take this course, for example, as a means to a certain kind of degree, and that might be a means to a certain kind of career, and so forth and so on. And so that's all driven by your own subjective desires. And in the end, that's where he puts even the desire for happiness. It's really on the subjective side. It's on the level of emotion, desire. You desire to be happy. It's a certain kind of affective state, you might say. And the affective goes here. Now the question is really, well, what's left on the objective side? <clears throat> if in the end we say, look, these subjective things, they can give you commands, which he refers to as imperatives. <clears throat> do this, right? Don't do that. But, he says, they always depend on the end you have in mind. You're selecting means to ends. And so what's that mean? Well, you value the end. You care about something, you have a desire for something, and then you choose this means to it. That really suggests that this is something you ought to do if you have that goal. So, lots of things we think are like this. He calls them imperatives of skill, but they're also imperatives of desire. It's a question of choosing a means to an end. So, suppose somebody says, you ought to try out that new Korean market place. That depends on your desires. It depends on your taste. It depends on the way that, whether somebody likes Korean market or not. It doesn't depend on something objective applying to all rational beings as such, which is gonna be this sort of category. So it comes down here. So if somebody says, you ought to try that place out, Really, Kant says, well, that's if you value certain kinds of things. So we could say all of these commands are what he refers to as hypothetical. That is to say, they depend on having a certain overall goal. And then he can say, you ought to do that to achieve that goal. So they're all about means leading to ends. And logically speaking, they all have this form if such and such. Then, do, or you ought to do, blah, blah, blah. Or, of course, it might be a negative thing, then don't, blah, blah, blah. But it's all depending on, you know, if you have a certain end, this is roughly where the end goes to, then, aha, means. And all these subjective things are going to have that form. If you want to be happy, then do this, okay? If you want to, to go to law school, then do this, don't do that, etc. You want to go to medical school, then do this, don't do that. Now, he says, when we're thinking about the purely objective side, this is something that's supposed to be independent of all of that, independent of your particular goals and desires, independent of emotion, independent of anything that Plato would locate outside the realm of reason itself. So, here's one thought. Nothing's left. <laughs> That's, I think, actually what Hegel thinks in the end. It's what Hume would say. A Humean is going to look at this and say, there's just nothing left. All of ethics is down here. There's nothing like that. Philip of Foot wrote, at one point, a very influential article called, called um, Morality is a System of Hypothetical Imperatives, where she, in effect, said, look, nothing comes out of this. In the end, it's all stuff like this. Well, Kant thinks that's wrong. So what could we actually get out of it? purely the sum? Well, I think there are two things. One of them is something we mentioned at the end of the last time, a form, okay? A certain form of rationality. 
And it's going to be tied back to that idea that a good will is the one and only thing that is good without qualification. After all, what we're really saying here is these ends are things you take to be good, but they're good under certain circumstances, right? And the means you think of as good because they lead to the ends. So all of these are good for things that are qualified goods. That is to say, they express imperatives or commands that have to do with, well, things that are good under certain circumstances or if you have certain desires. But suppose we were looking for something independent of all of that. Then we're going to be saying, ah, oh, wait a minute. All of this has to do with those goods we consider qualified. i.e. things that are good only under certain circumstances. But here, if we're thinking on the objective side, this ought to be appropriate for, well, <laughs> unqualified goods, things that are good without qualification. So what could that be like? Well, if it's true that this is appropriate for things that would be goods without qualification, Since they're good without qualification, this is going to give us what he refers to as a categorical imperative. And it will just have the form, do this, don't do this. We won't need to make it hypothetical. It's not dependent on anything. Okay? It doesn't depend on any of this stuff. It's not qualified, desire, emotion. Circumstances make no difference to it. It's something that we can say across the board. No matter what you desire, no matter what emotional state you're in, no matter what circumstance you're in, ah, this is something that relates to the form of command in general, and it's going to have to do with an unqualified good. Well, here is the first step. <laughs> we can say, okay, what could such an imperative be? What could we advise you no matter what? Things like try out the new Korean barbecue place, or buy chalk that doesn't produce a lot of dust, <laughs> or whatever. That, not going to be like that, right? Those are things that are useful bits of advice, given certain desires and circumstances. But now, what could you say to anyone, anytime, anywhere, that would be good moral advice? Yeah? Like self-preservation, Aquinas talks about that. Ah, what about that possibility? Self-preservation. We could say, and indeed some philosophers have said, that's the basic axiom, self-preservation. Preserve yourself, preserve your own life. Is that something we could treat as appropriate under all circumstances? I mean, some people don't want to live, so I don't know. Yeah, some people don't want to live, right? Now, why would you be in a situation where you don't want to live? You think self-preservation is not a good idea. It doesn't seem like it's good without qualification, right? So what's a circumstance where even life itself would seem like not a good thing? Finals week. <laughs> okay. Finals week. Finals week. Yeah, right. <laughs> Every December in May you experience this. What else? Yeah. Like a, it's like a really big financial burden. Ah, okay. You're overwhelmed financially. You think, well, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in, well, in the old days, in debtor's prison. Or now, just, you know, utterly impoverished. I think a life like that isn't worth living. What else? Uh, you're in old age and you're on life support. Okay, you're in old age, life support, it's very uncomfortable, maybe you're in great pain. If you're born without a vital organ. You're born without a vital organ, maybe yes, I mean, it depends on vital, but it could be, <laughs> Meaning, could be really bad. They, right? they like attach like a machine to do it. Yeah, I suppose you have to live attached to attach to a machine or like the guy who had to live inside the bubble. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a movie called Mist. I don't know if you've seen it, but like at the end, they're like in the car and they're trapped. There's no way out. So he like kills his son and he's about to kill himself. So I guess that. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's a there's a paper on euthanasia that starts with this horrible example of a British lorry driver, a truck driver, who is in a terrible accident and it's carrying flammable materials. It bursts into flame. Um, no one can get close to him, no one can get him out of the cab, he's stuck in there, and he's being roasted to death, and he begs for people to kill him, and indeed, apparently, I think some officer did, <coughs> um, because he was suffering horribly. Um, there could be situations like that, but there could be other situations that are less tragic, maybe, where, let's say, you're in wartime, and you realize that in order to achieve the military objective, 
some people actually have to go on what is in effect a suicide mission. Self-preservation would tell you, don't do it, don't go. <laughs> right? But you might think, no, there's something more important than my own life, the, the, the success of the mission, success and victory in the war, etc. Well, in those cases, it would look like even self-preservation, though it's like the quest for happiness in a way. It's something that does have a huge moral value. It's something that almost all of us will value. But of course, that's true for human beings. Kant is actually after bigger game. Aristotle wants to talk about what is good for mankind. Kant says, I want to know what's good in this world or even out of it. I want to know what's universally and necessarily good for any being who is rational, capable of deliberating and making choices and acting. And that means that even something that all human beings would share, like a quest for self-preservation or happiness, isn't going to fully satisfy. They'll say that still related to our desire to live, our desire to be happy. And even if every human being shares it, we could imagine beings that don't. Yeah. I think Plato talked about intrinsic goods, which are like goods in and above themselves. I think like one of the biggest ones was knowledge. Just knowledge period, just any kind of knowledge is just good of itself. Okay, what if we say knowledge? What about that possibility? Um, after all, the Delphic Oracle says, know thyself. Something echoed by Plato and by Socrates. Aristotle starts, starts the metaphysics. All people by nature desire to know. And so we could say, well, okay, um, what about knowledge? Or self-knowledge, know thyself, but either form, would it, would it satisfy us? Yeah. Uh, could it be possible to like know you find out something and uh, now you're miserable because you know that fact? Okay, good. Um, surely there are cases where knowledge is not a good thing. Um, and maybe even where self-knowledge is not a good thing, right? You find out, well, actually last time we talked about an example in that story from the Boston Globe. Somebody finds out the person they had thought their whole life was their father was not really their father. <laughs> um, or they find out that they have some long lost sister and try to contact that person, and that person says, drop dead on them. Um, they were like, they, they were happier not knowing, right? Or the guy who was 95, I think when he found out that his wife in the 1940s had an affair when he was fighting in Europe in World War II, so he divorces her. They're both still alive in their mid 90s. My whole life is based on a lie. I mean, that's a, that's a sad, sad, pathetic story. But, like, yeah, he was way better off not knowing that. Uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, sometimes, like, another example I think a lot of people use is, like, knowing if you're going to die. Like, when, like, the day and time, or how. Oh, good, good, good. That, I mean, connected to a bit of self knowledge there in a way. Suppose you knew exactly the date you would die and how. But a lot of that stuff can be good. I guess it depends on what perspective you're looking at. Like finding out your wife that cheated on you could be good in the end, and, you know, I don't know. Or finding out you know when you're gonna die is kind of liberating in that way that I know how much time I have and I can accomplish things that I wanted to do that I haven't, you know. So right. I guess it depends on you. No, right, I mean it could be it could be reassuring, right? If you find out, oh, you'll die in your sleep at age ninety-six, low blood pressure. Cool. They like awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or, you know, you'll be hit by a truck tomorrow. Okay. No, that there went by today, right? <laughs> I don't know, like, okay, got to go to church tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's still be me. I'm grateful. Like, like, I, can, I can better lay out my life. Yeah, I know what I'm going to do. Right, I mean, quickly make up that will, delete those files from your computer. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but let's be honest, like, a lot of us procrastinate things. Yeah. So it'll end up being like, oh, man, I... It's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm reminded of the cartoon that shows these two dinosaurs looking at Noah's Ark sailing away. It's like, oh darn, was that today? <laughs> 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 yeah. There is like one other thing is I think you like said it, but like a lot of really, really intelligent people are miserable. So like there's this whole like so why really like, like to symbolic to be wise and ignorance is bliss. Oh. I'm a complex like Nietzsche, really intelligent guy, but miserable. And like writes about it. That's well. That's true. I don't really understand this, but it is. It is true that some of the really, really brilliant people I've known, the most brilliant people, seem to be miserable people. And I don't mean that as a moral evaluation. They just seem very unhappy and 
they find it very difficult to get along in the world. Um, I've known, well, there was a kid in my high school who was like that, absolutely broken. Uh, graduating several years early, you know, MIT and Caltech fight all over. Perfect SAT scores and all that kind of thing. But he always sat alone in one corner of the cafeteria and seemed to have no social polite. I never saw him smile. And it's kind of like, yeah, I, you know, I, I wish I were that smart, but I don't really want that person's life at all. And think of Nietzsche, or think of uh, Emil Post, one of the greatest logicians and mathematicians of the 20th century, um, in and out of mental institutions the whole time. John Nash, similar type of story, uh, the founder of game theory, so we'll be studying Nash equilibria later, of course. Um, yeah, you look at the thing, maybe over a certain level, high intelligence is not a good thing, and, and a great amount of knowledge is not a good thing for a person. Um, what is the one thing, oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say a less trivial example where it's hard to argue is the, the knowledge of how to weaponize smallpox is, is not something we, we can find a silver lining on. Ooh, very good. There is, there is the knowledge of Pandora's box, right? <laughs> so yeah, how you weaponize smallpox or how you weaponize anthrax or something, you might think, you know, mankind was better off without such knowledge. It's not just that you personally were better off without it. It's like, yeah, we would all be better off if nobody knew that. Um, so yes, there can certainly be kinds of knowledge like that. And consequently, we're reluctant to say knowledge is good without qualification. It does seem to be good for its own sake. So it's in that category that Plato and Aristotle would have said, look, these things are intrinsically good. But Kant warns us, not everything like that is good, no matter what good, in an absolutely unqualified sense. He thinks one thing is, which is what? The good will, right? So suppose we said that's the one thing like that. The good will. Then, what would the categorical imperative have to look like? No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter what you want, we can say, have a good will. So we might think, yeah, here's what it would have to look like. Have a good will. But so far, we don't know what that is. <laughs> so that's of limited help. Kant himself doesn't put it this way. And We'll look at the two basic forms, as I see it, that he has. They come from the things that he does take as fundamental here. One of them is the form, and the other is the thing that all rational beings necessarily have. But before we get to that step, let's look at the formal part. All of this side, the, the objective side, we said starts with the concept of law, the concept of duty. And if we think about what is essential to law, Kant says, we see that it has, that all laws have something in common. They are commands, they tell you to do this and don't do that, but also they are universal. Okay? So if we think about the form of law, we realize, aha, they all have this universal form. Everyone is to do such and such. Now, one way of thinking about this then, to put more teeth in this idea of having a good will, is to say, that means you have to act in accordance with law, but that means you have to act on the basis of things that are yours. So we can express this as act on the basis, we can just say act on principle, act on the basis of Universal considerations. The way he puts it is this. Act only on that maxim. You can at the same time will as a universal law. And he sometimes raises it as a question of, what if everyone did that? Okay? What he means is, look, think about the maxim of your action. What is the maxim? He says it's your subjective principle of volition. So as you go through and you're thinking about this, it's not the objective command from up a lot stuff. It's your subjective way of taking. It's why you're doing it, roughly speaking. Um, and you think, what if everyone did that? Everyone in my situation 
who wants what I want, what if they did this? And then he says, could you continue to will that? Could you say, yeah, I make the choice, not just that I do this, but that everyone do it too? Well, he thinks quite often the answer is no. And that's important. So the categorical imperative in this first form, it's called the formula of universal law. which is nice because it starts from the premise that the law is universal. And it says, act only on maxim. You can, at the same time, will, <laughs> as universal law. And the second form, which is sometimes called the formula of the law of nature, is to just add to this a universal law of nature. So that's why I see that one as a minor variant of the first one. Now, why does he say that? Um, I think the idea is supposed to be this is, imagine that this is a universal law that everyone has to do. It's not like, oh, what if everyone's supposed to do it? <laughs> it's rather, everyone really does it. We're not just talking about a law, a legal type of thing which people might obey or might not. We're talking about a law of nature that everything has to obey. If this thing, when I grow up it, is governed by Galileo's law, it has to do it. It doesn't have a choice. It's not like, well, sometimes it chooses to, sometimes it just falls off, you know, the way things are. <laughs> These pieces of chalk have a mind of their own. No, it's not like that. So we're to imagine that everybody does it. Well, yeah, but why would that have any power? His idea is this. Immorality depends on making an exception for yourself. So I want you to imagine for the moment that you're a thief. And not just in the sense that you occasionally give in to some overwhelming urge or something like that. I mean that's your job. You think, well, I graduated from beauty with a philosophy degree. I thought, what can I do as a philosopher? <laughs> I thought, well, justify anything. Aha, uh -huh, but I have to get money. I could either go into law, <laughs> or <laughs> I could become a thief. <coughs> Nobody's mad for that. Well, <laughs> okay, so you think, yeah, um, I, want to, I want to start robbing for people. Um, now, you say, wait a minute, that seems wrong. I could say, in fact, I might say, I don't move by your sin. I live by my own set rules, man. And my rule is take what you want. Okay? You don't do that, that's your problem. I see that Porsche parked in the car, and I think, I don't want that Porsche. I take it. I see that great bicycle over there, I take it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> what would he say about like Robin Hood, who has goodwill and Robin from the rich? Ooh, okay, good, 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 good. Yeah. Um, that's that's a harder question, because in this ordinary case, Kant's concerned to say, look, this person may say they live by a different set of rules, but actually they don't. Try robbing from them. Are they cool with it? The answer is no. Right? Say, oh, well, you know what? I think that is a good I'm going to do that too. I'm going to take your stuff. <laughs> they, I think it's, yeah, you know, I think every, yeah, that's cool with me. You do it, I do it, whatever. No, they're not going to do that, right? They're going to defend their own thing. They're going to say, Wait, robbery is okay for me, it's not okay for you. I'm willing to rob, but I'm not willing to be robbed. In other words, they are making an exception for themselves. They're not willing to have a universal law of robbing, because that means they'd be robbed. Now, Kant seems to be saying, so actually robbery would be an example of something we couldn't universalize in this way. But now you point out a really powerful objection. What about people who steal from the well, as the fable has it, steal from the rich and give to the poor. Um, or if you think about what Robin Hood's really doing, he's stealing from the sheriff of Nottingham um, and Prince John, and he's giving back to the people. So you could either see him as a redistributionist, quasi-Marxist, or you can see him as a libertarian fighting the man <laughs> you know, liberty. But whatever you think of him as, you know, he's going to be saying, wait, I'm, I'm not doing it because I'm living by a different set of rules, and actually I am willing to universalize the rule robbed from the unjust, uh, those who have unjustly, and give to those who have a just 
deserving of it. And this is the way I have to do that, given the current political circumstances. And if you look at it that way, you would say, well, wait a minute, his maxim isn't just take what you want. It's rather take from those who have unjustly and give to those who deserve but do not have. Right? Now, there are two problems with this, at least. <laughs> One is a problem that W.D. Ross brings out in his book on Kant. It looks like there are many ways of describing that action. Okay, Robin Hood stole. Robin Hood stole money from the sheriff. Um, Robin Hood stole money from the sheriff in 1342 on September 17th. Uh, I can get highly specific. I can also get very general. Robin Hood did something. <laughs> okay, so what am I asking? Is that a universal law? Is it do something? Is it steal? Is it steal from sheriffs? Steal from the sheriff of Nottingham? Steal, but only on September 17th. Uh, what's my rule here? I have to know what to do. So in short, a lot of people have said, oh, Kant is assuming that for any action or contemplating, any decision, there is a maxim. There's one and only one maxim that I test. But how do I know what that is? Now, how could a Kantian answer that? It's going to turn out, I mean, some of these like, hey, steal. That's, that's not going to be universalizable. Steal from the sheriff of Nottingham on September 17th, 1342. Maybe that is, because that's really specific, right? Uh, or maybe do something. You could universalize that. <laughs> but anyway, what, so what are we saying here? Yeah. Uh, you could respond that if we just gave everybody the prerogative to decide who the unjust is and decide for themselves when they can steal and when they cannot, that maxim, and that vagueness and the overbroadness of it is not going to be responsible. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, but everyone is going to have their own different ideas of what is moral and what is right and what they would want to be done to themselves. Um, and so you could have a serious problem there. Um, it, where everyone seems to think that they should behave, that everyone else should behave in a certain way because that's what they will for them or for other people right. because they would will that for themselves. But. Ah, well, yes, um, Kant is aware of that problem with the golden rule. He says, really, what I'm giving you is a version of the golden rule. But if I say as you would want to be treated, that seems to make it dependent on your particular desires. And surely, morality should be dependent on your particular desires. It's, so he's trying to give you basically the cleaned up version of the golden rule that's independent of desire and is trying to remove the problem you're mentioning, but maybe he falls into it anyway. Yeah. You could say like don't succumb to injustice or like tyranny or something like that, you know? Some ah. way like if you were a, a Jew during the Holocaust, you're not just gonna you're not just gonna the concentration camp. You know, you're gonna fight back against any injustice or tyranny against you, you know. You're not just gonna follow along. Ah, oh, very good. Yeah, often people think of this, Ross's objection, that is, in terms of, you know, more or less specific maxims going into kind of one line. But I think part of what you're pointing, at, pointing out is, actually, there are many different ways. There's this stealing, doing something. There's this way of thinking about it in terms of injustice, now more or less specifically. And then we might think of other things, like fight the power or whatever. So actually, it's, it's like there are many, many different um, sort of, powers from highly specific to very unspecific. And you're right, indeed. Now, Robin Hood's going to say, look, it's those people have an unjust, right? Whereas the thief on the corner may not say those people, I mean, maybe he does say those people have an unjustly, but maybe not. Maybe just says, hey, this is how I make my living. And so one way to bring out that difference, and it's a difference I think both of you were sort of focusing in on too, is Look, we have to pay attention to what's in the person's mind. That is to say, this maxim is a subjective principle of volition, of willing. It's what you have in mind. It's what you're trying to do. So are you just saying steal to get money? Are you saying steal to correct an injustice? Um, what, what is your goal? And what is, your, what is really in your head? And that's what we're evaluating. So in other words, we're not really evaluating an action considered in isolation. 
We have to think about why you're doing it, what you have in mind. If you want to think of it this way, we're evaluating the maxim here directly and then the action indirectly. And so we're saying, is that a legitimate reason right, for acting? Is that a legitimate thing to, to say, I'm going to take other people's stuff because I want it, let's say. Um, and so, now, even if we say, ah, oh, it's really about injustice, then we still face the problem, well, maybe people have different conceptions of justice. But at least we've got some concept of how we might narrow down this range of maxims. What does that person really have in mind? Yeah, um, Kant also seems to believe that uh, uh, the maxim, you can play by the person's rules if they've done injustice to you. Like he talks about this with the death penalty, like you're allowed to give the death penalty to a murderer. A murderer. Right. Um, maybe <clears throat> for the Robin Hood example, it's similar. If Robin Hood is stealing tax dollars, which is in his view theft, I guess. Um, so, you know, stealing from a thief is okay by those rules. Ooh, good, good, good. Yes, one thing Kant does say is, look, you can be held responsible for the universal version of your maxim. So suppose you are a thief and you operate on the principle of stealing. We can steal from you, legitimately. We can go and take that stuff back. If the police raid your hideout and they take the stuff while you're not there, you can't come back and say, huh, those police are no better than I am. See, they steal too. No, it's like they have a right to take it back. And, uh, and the same thing, you're right, is true of capital punishment. He says, look, if somebody's operated by the rule of killing, then actually you can hold them responsible for that universal law and put them to death. There's nothing legitimate about that. You're just applying the same rule they were willing to apply to somebody else. Now, it's slippery because it seems to me the motivations of the state in doing that are somewhat different from the motivation the person is likely to have had in committing the murder um, or in stealing. But nevertheless, he thinks, you're right. Um, we can hold you responsible for the universal version. So if somebody says, I'm going to cheat, then you can cheat them. <laughs> it's OK. Um, this will be relevant when we get to get game theory and think about the strategy called tit for tat. Somebody does it to you, you do it back to them. And uh, basically, that's in principle, yeah, Kant's willing to accept that. Now. All right, this is one way of thinking about it, and this seems to make a lot of sense until you look at his examples. And then you realize, oh wait, I don't understand this so well at all. But what are his examples? The first one has to do with suicide. I'm not going to talk about it, really, because it seems to me the hardest one to understand in a way. However, it's also worth pointing out in connection with what we just said, that he's not actually thinking all suicide is immoral in all circumstances. He has a footnote where he says, look, I, the, the spy who commits suicide in wartime rather than divulge secrets to the enemy, um, or the person who um, damages themselves and ends up killing themselves in order to try to save their life, that's a different thing. Um, and so it's up to ethics proper to figure out the exact boundaries of this. But he does give the example of keeping your promises. So he says, a man is in debt, desperate for money, off, asks to borrow money with the promise that he will repay it. But he knows he'll never be in a position to repay it. Okay? Now, may he make that promise? Can you make a false promise to repay someone even though you know you won't? This came up in every Popeye cartoon I watched as a little kid. There was a character named Wim who used to say, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> and he never did pay anyone for a like that. He has student loans. Sorry? I say he has student loans. Oh, he has student loans. Yes, <laughs> it sort of is student loans. Or, yeah, uh, this, you know why you shouldn't do this? It leads to the financial crisis in 2008. Anyway, uh, but yes, is that acceptable? Anyway, Claude goes through the exam, and he says, well, look, what if everyone did that? What if everyone who needed money asked, pretended to promise to repay it, even though they knew they never made these promises, but they were false promises. Our entire currency design on that is we have a currency. Well, that's a good point, a deeper point that he raises. He just says, look, all such promises would be just laughed at as vain pretenses. But you're right, in a sense, all currency 
that has a fiat character is based on that promise. And so if nobody's willing to pay, pay that, you know, take that seriously, the whole economic system collapses. So his point is, yeah, look, there would be no such thing as borrowing lending. There would be no such thing as promising. So it emerges that there are really two parts to his test here. One is, can, or I guess I should say could, everyone follow that axiom. And in this case, his answer is no. There'd be no such thing as promising. You say, but I promised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would be promised. Right? No, but people would laugh at you. It would not make any sense. There'd be no banks, there'd be no currency, but in general, this would spread throughout the world. No such thing as promising. Now, it seems to me you could raise questions about this. David Wiggins, for example, says, well, wait a minute. What would people do in the real world? Suppose that everybody starts going around doing this. Our bank's just going to say, and no point to this business anymore. Shut it down. Nobody's honest. What do banks do when a lot of people start to fall in the They shut down. Well, some of them do shut down. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people. Some of them collapse. Yes. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Like you can all have different kinds of collateral. Like your home can be collateral, and that's kind of what they try to make happen in the to fix the 2008 recession. Yeah, good. They can demand collateral. They can say, well, what are you going to put up as collateral? So that if you don't pay, I get that thing. So, yeah, they might demand collateral. They might do extensive credit checks to make sure you're the kind of person who actually does repay loans. Now, if nobody's repaying them, maybe credit checks are worth anything. Like, yeah, we know the outcome of that one. But still, they're going to do something. So it's not clear it all collapses. The second thing is, though, could a rational being will it? We don't want to say, could you? Because that, that is going to make it dependent on your desires, your emotional state, your, what you want in particular. And it's supposed to be independent of that. We want something operating purely at this object or level. But we can ask, could a rational being will it? Would it be a rational thing to will that everybody do that? And so that brings me to his next example. He considers developing talents. And he says, you know, well, somebody has a lot of talent. They could work to develop it, but they think, ah, I'd rather just sit around the beach. They decide to live like a slack. There's a whole movie about that set in Austin that <laughs> stars among other people, a former colleague of mine here in the philosophy <laughs> department. Um, and he might say, okay, can everyone be a slacker? Well, he says, yes. However, could a rational being will that everybody be a slacker? His answer is no. Now, why not? Everyone could just slack off. Nobody could be developing their talents, but nobody could want that. No rational being could will that. Why not? What's wrong with that? Well, what is, yeah, go ahead. When no one's sufficiently contributing, people die. I mean, I, oh. If farmers all slack off, there's no food. Right. Okay, good. I mean, one thing to think about is, look, why, why don't we just all lie about the beach? Wouldn't that be awesome? We just all go to the beach. We all sit around. Well, okay, that works for an afternoon. But then you get hungry. And you think, man, i, I got to go find something to eat. Well, everybody else is just lying on the beach. Right? Before we all entered this, you ordered a margarita. Now you said, I'm going to have another margarita. Sorry, there's nobody to bring you a margarita. They're lying on the beach. Eventually, you all run out of tequila. <laughs> and then you think, well, now what? Nobody's making tequila. They're all just out there on the beach. So there's that sort of problem. Look, all the particular things you want are going to depend on people doing things and developing talents. But also, everything you do develops talent. Look, what is rationality? It's the ability to use means to get to ends. This is what's really essential to being a rational being. But rationality then, well, that's something, and your talents, that's a directed towards a specific way of doing this, a talent for making tequila, or growing food, or making music, or doing philosophy, or whatever it is you do. Then, you can say, well, yeah, rationality is a matter of, if nobody's exercising their rationality and developing their talents, then 
we're all in trouble. None of us can actually be very effective at gaining any kind of goal we have. Yeah? Is it possible for us to not be, I'm not just saying like make an irrational decision, but is it possible for us to not be rational because it's in our like nature and like we're actually in for the desire to be rational and not have knowledge? So could we even like have that? Like he's creating this ideal state, but is that even possible? That's a great question. I think Kant's answer is no. And it's not just because of human nature, it's because of what it is to be a rational being. I value the ends that I have, whatever they are, and I value my ability to get them. That means I value my own rationality. So the second thing here is actually this universal value, this thing that all rational beings take as valuable in itself, namely rational nature itself. I value my ability to attain ends. And that leads him to the formula we'll look at next time, the formula of humanity. All rational beings value rationality as an end in itself. And if that's true, we can formulate another version of the imperative that will be easier to apply.